Hi, this is Karen Launchbaugh at the University of Idaho with a little short activity in the Rangeland Principles class to see if you can recognize which plants have higher forage value. So to begin this, make sure that you've printed off the forage quality note guide, and then we'll just go through this and see if you can tell which is better or worse. Remember, there's three main factors that influence the forage quality of a plant. The first is the ratio of cell wall to cell contents. Second is lignification, and then the third would be any antiquality factors. Okay, which of these two is better? On the left is balsam oryza sagittata, or arrow leaf balsam root. On the right side is western yarrow, both plants that are widespread throughout Idaho and throughout the Pacific Northwest, and one is more nutritious than the other. Which is it? Well, of course, it's arrow leaf balsam root, and that's largely because it is very leafy, and leaves have high cell contents to cell wall ratio. They're very thin walls, and they have lots of contents inside of them. And also, leafy plants are more nutritious than less leafy plants. So at least in this one example, we have these beautiful big leaves that would be easy, nutritious, delicious. An animal could eat them on the left, and less leafy material on the right. So leaves are good, and nutritious. Okay, here's a grass. Which is better? We've got crested wheatgrass on the left, blue bunch wheatgrass on the right, both pretty closely related plants. And in this case, of course, same principle. The blue bunch wheatgrass on the right is more nutritious because it's leafier, it has more leaves all the way up the stem, so that means there's more cell contents, which is the soluble sugars and proteins and vitamins of the plant versus the cell walls, which can be digested, but they're not soluble. They have to go through the gut, through the rumen. So leafy plants are more nutritious in grasses and in forbs. Okay, here on the left is deer brush, which is a plant that we've studied in this class. And on the right is early balsam root, which is more nutritious. They're both quite leafy, um, but in this case, the arrow leaf balsam root would be more nutritious only because its stems are not lignified. So woody plants have lignified stems. So deer might be able to nibble off just the leaves, but every once in a while they're going to get some of those lignified stems which are not as nutritious because they've got wood in them as opposed to herbaceous plants which are not lignified. They die back to the ground every year. So just in general, uh, forbs and shrubs can both be good, especially if the animal can just get the leaves off. But in general, the forbs would be better because they're not lignified. Here's another. Now we're talking about a forb on the left, taper tip hawksbeard versus crested wheatgrass on the right. They're both pretty leafy. Which one would be more nutritious, say, to a deer or a sheep? Well, it's the taper tip hawksbeard. In general, forbs have um, thinner cell walls than grass cells, so they have higher cell content to cell wall ratio. But just in general, the really nutritious plants out on the range are forbs. Um, grasses are good, they've got a lot of energy in those cell walls, but not much, as much of the soluble compounds that would be inside the cell contents. So forbs are generally more nutritious. The interesting thing about taper tip, ho taper tip hawksbeard also is that it has a, a latex, a white latex, if you um, it's in the same family as dandelion. You know, when you pull off a dandelion, it's got kind of that white uh, sap in it. So paper tip hawksbeard has that all also. And although we think of that as kind of yucky, that white sap, but it's sticky. And if something's sticky, that means it has energy compounds in it. In this case, it has sort of some sugars and soluble compounds. So out on the range, something that has that white sap can be very good. For example, this plant is important for sage grouse or for rodents or ground nesting birds because they need high energy when they eat these forbs that can give them that energy. So grasses don't have that kind of milky sap. Mostly the energy in grasses are have to go through the rumen to be degraded and cut apart by rumen microbes. Okay, now we've got cheatgrass and cheatgrass. Cheatgrass on the left during the growing season, cheatgrass on the right in the dormant season. Okay, no brainer. Definitely the young growing leafy plant is more nutritious. But why? One is that growing plants are photosynthesizing, and so those compounds that they're using to photosynthesize and to function as a plant are, for the animal, nutrients and energy sources. 
So things that are growing have soluble nutrients and energy. On the right, those plants, once they've gone dormant, they can also be subject to leaching. So if, it, if you get rain on, especially annual grassland, annual grasses, a lot of whatever was in the cell, if it wasn't transported or lost when the, the plants just shut down business for the season, it can be just leached out. So you might've heard about people talking about leaching of nutrients and that's what happens. The cell walls become porous when the plant becomes dormant. And if it rains, it can just leach out whatever um, good compounds were in the plant. So here's another example, a little different. It's crested wheatgrass and crested wheatgrass. This plant is uh, more stable in the winter. And of course, the green leafy material is better and the dormant period um, material on the right can be leached. Um, but those stems, those stems that are sticking up above the soil on the right hand side, that's energy. So although we've lost a lot of nutrients, that's kind of like um, standing spaghetti, you know, an, an animal can eat it and it can um, go into the rumen. The rumen microbes can degrade it into uh, volatile fatty acids that are energy sources for the animal. So that standing dead material is not as good as green, but it still has energy in it. Here's another one. Which is better? Shad scale on the left, winter fat on the right. They're both woody plants. But in this case, winter fat, of course, it's winter fat, that's its name. So it does provide good energy, especially in the winter. We know that shrubs are very important in the winter for animals because they have photosynthetic material above the, uh, they have stems above the soil surface so they can be eaten and those stems are alive. But one is better than the other. In this case, the stems that are above the ground in the case of winter fat are much thinner. They're not very lignified at all. In fact, they're more herbaceous. Whereas the stems, as you can see in shad scale, are, they're, they're stiff stems. They can still be eaten. They crunch up pretty well in the winter. And this is a very important winter source. But if you had a choice between winter fat and shad scale and you're a deer that's roaming across the range, most often deer, cow, sheep, elk would take the winter fat. It's higher quality because they're both lignified plants, but some plants have thinner stems than others. Okay, here's another one. We got lupin, tail cup lupin on the left and taper tip hawksbeard on the right. Of course, taper tip hawksbeard is the winner, mostly because the lupin contains an anti-quality factor. It has that alkaloid that we've learned, talked about, which reduces the forage quality. So the lupin is very leafy and it can be eaten in moderation. So animals will often learn that they can eat some of these toxic plants and they just try not to go over the edge. Um, they have mechanisms to learn how much is too much. So there, there's a lot of things that we eat that if we ate too much of it, um, it, it would be toxic, but we, we may even want to eat a little bit or need to eat a little. Um, it's interesting, the most toxic compound on earth is actually um, salt. Salt will kill almost everything, and yet salt is an as essentially um, essential mineral that we need to survive. So we need some, but if we eat too much salt or drink too much salt, uh, we can die. So everything in moderation. But now here we've got winter fat and crested wheatgrass, which is better? Say it's in the winter. These are both important winter forage species. Which is better? That's kind of a trick question because they're both good. Woody plants are very important for nutrients in the winter because again, they have those live stems above the soil surface and those live stems are active. They've got um, enzymes and minerals and cell contents in them that are important for nutrients. The grasses are very important for winter uh, energy sources. So again, kind of the standing spaghetti, uh, we eat it and our uh, system gets energy out of spaghetti. Animals eat these stems, ruminants, and uh, horses or rabbits can eat those stems and the microbes inside of them can turn that into energy. One more, which of these plants is better? Big sagebrush, juniper, salt cedar, leafy spurge? Well, it's kind of a trick question because it depends. In this case, it depends largely on the animal. Um, for, let's start with sagebrush. Sagebrush is not very good forage for cows. Uh, yeah, they can eat it a little, but they, they can't really make a living on it. Sheep can also eat a little, do better. But then there's other animals like pronghorn, which eat sagebrush extensively in the winter. 
and also sage sage grouse which survive they they require it so those terpenes in sagebrush which are detrimental to cows are essential to sage grouse so the animal makes a difference juniper depends on the species some junipers are quite palatable in texas there's um blueberry or a redberry juniper is not palatable there's a there's a pinchotes juniper that is the western juniper that we have out here in the west is generally not very palatable so in that case it depends on which species of juniper you're talking about salt cedar is the one in the middle on the right here and it is pretty much not palatable um, for anything it's got a lot of salt and as i said too much salt can be detrimental so animals can take a bite or two to kind of meet their salt requirements but then after that they just really can't handle salt and if you've been in a lot of salt cedar when you walk through it the salt actually it's so salty that it'll just crumble off on you and when you get back from a day of, in the field in the salt cedar you just you're just a salt lick you just got salt all over you so the plant really does accumulate salt it, it earns its name salt cedar and although animals need a little salt, they can't handle a lot. So there's really not any animals that do well on salt cedar. Uh, the final one there, leafy spurge, is an interesting one because it depends on the species also. Pretty well known that cows don't like leafy spurge. And if you graze a pasture, the leafy spurge will probably expand if you're grazing it with cows. On the other hand, sheep and goats like it pretty well. So you can use sheep and goats to actually suppress the plant and do targeted grazing with sheep or goats to try to improve forage for elk and cattle. So, and again, depends on species. So which is better can depend on the species of the animal or the species of the plant. And yet some plants are really hard to overcome any of the secondary compounds or anti-quality factors in them. So I rambled on a bit, but I hope that that gave you some of the principles so that uh, you can recognize a plant when you look at it and determine whether it is nutritious or not.